feel about myself. I feel that it's the unknown, you know, things I don't know. And that's what I'm starting to, to say that I, I, I know. It may not be true because there are things I don't know. Hello, everyone. Make sure to call your friends on the fourth floor. Let them know that the highlight panel is about to start. <laughs> this will be the most enjoyable panel of your experience. <laughs> I'm Brian Dawson. I work with uh, Greenlit Content. I'll be the moderator of this panel. This is the Why Content is King panel to make sure you're in the correct space. Let's see half of you get up now. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'd like to go ahead and start with uh, having our panelists kind of uh, introduce themselves, give them a little bit of background about uh, who they are and what they do. I'll start on that side. All right, we'll start on that side. Although you already know him. He was on earlier. I just talked about <laughs> Do it again. Yeah, I could talk again. Uh, my name is Lavelle Walker. I'm the head of esports at MGM. Um, something I didn't talk about during my past discussion was uh, a little bit about my history. So I actually grew up in Las Vegas, born and raised, got into the casino industry uh, 10 years ago, so straight out of undergrad. Straight, strictly with slots and table games on the operation side and on the marketing side of things, um, and then later transitioned into sports betting and built our mobile sports betting app in Nevada with IGT. Um, but I, I did that for the past three years, and through that experience, I was able to get a little bit of exposure to esports and esports betting functions, and fell in love with it and got lucky and carved out my own niche and went to my chairman and said, "Hey, we don't have an esports strategy. I don't know how we're going to win here because nobody in our company is focused on it 100%." It's just 10% of somebody's job here, 10% of somebody's job's here. It's not how you do it. Just let me handle it. And luckily, he obliged. So I'm, I'm, I'm here. So I'm uh, Daniel Kelly. I'm the head of marketing for HyperX. So HyperX is a maker of gaming peripherals. So we make uh, gaming headsets, keyboards, mice, mouse pads, uh, even microphones now. Uh, we got into that market because of the emergence of streaming and, and so on. Uh, we're actually a division of a much larger tech company called Kingston. Uh, who noticed about 15 years ago who was buying these really high-end hard drives and high-end RAM, and it was gamers. So uh, that really started this whole thing of HyperX, where they carved out an entire division with the resources needed to, to build products specific to gamers, um, and then to allow us to, to, to run the marketing strategy. So we would be seen as an endemic um, sponsor or brand in this space, and we've been sponsoring these tournaments and teams for actually over 13, 14 years now. So a lot of experiences now, everything's kind of evolving with all of the non-endemics coming in. Well, so my job is not even half as cool as these two. My name's Darren Traub, I'm, I'm a lawyer, right? So I, uh, I work at Davis Wright Tremaine and we have a dedicated esports practice team that I help head up with some others that are in the audience. Um, my real specialties though are within esports, the competitions, the conferences, uh, the championships because in a prior life I was an EDM festival attorney and kind of still am so I do about 55 different music festivals around the world some of the bigger ones uh, and then I've kind of transferred that into esports into video games since it as everyone sort of seeing this this melding and merging of the two um, and, and then sort of helping now to build out our esports practice on the content side the publications the licensing uh, and of course the events and marketing I think that you're very fun, so. Uh, uh, so I'm kind of the resident nerd as I'm looking around here uh, on this panel. I've been in this scene in and out uh, for quite some time. I used to play Counter-Strike um, competitively way back in the day. Uh, like, and you're like, oh, CS, go. Now, 1.6 in source was what I was really into. Um, I've been in marketing before. It was really called content marketing or um, social. Uh, building content for Viacom, um, LA Times, and uh, JP Morgan Chase, and then I kind of got back into this, and I've done creative strategy for PUBG and Twitch. Uh, I'm currently with United Esports, which is a marketing agency that is all people from veterans in the space that are just really understanding that this is a unique environment that needs special, uh, special attention. And so they're bringing, helping bring brands into the space. 
All right, thank you guys. So uh, I want to start with a nice easy one, nice softball pitch for you guys. Uh, can you tell me what role does content play for your companies in terms of esports? Custom content. I'll start. Uh, it's absolutely key. I think um, you know the biggest point I'm probably going to keep hitting through this whole panel is uh, you need to develop a very tailored content strategy uh, for your brand or your service or your product. Uh, because you could go a hundred different directions in this whole thing of content as it relates to gaming or, or esports. But for us, it's a, it's a bit of the, I guess, the fuel for the engine, if you will, for what we do. Because you can then, if you have a good piece of content uh, and it's tailored to a specific type of a gamer or an audience, uh, then you wrap that, you know, with, with advertising and social media and everything else to get uh, more awareness for it. But um, the actual it, which is the content that you're developing to hopefully attract and actually give back to some degree, to those gamers that appreciate a certain type of content is absolutely critical for, for HyperX. Well, for me, it's community management, and it's the idea of doing social strategy that actually makes sense and connects with the audience, um, and being really, really specific with and helping guide brands and just even teams to really find and own that audience. But it's really important because to me, that's Gamers have had, before Twitch existed, I mean, we had IRC, we were on ICQ, we were in FARC.com, <laughs> channel reddits and something awful forums, and it's just kind of evolved to this space. But in the end, like the, the strategies that worked for, um, you know, bloggers back in the day is still what's working today. And just finding like a really cool way to weave that story through that hits all your, your points is what I love the most about it. We're definitely going to age ourselves quite a bit during this panel. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I'll add on to something Dan just said, fuel for the engine. We definitely have the engine at MGM. Our, our goal is to really get everybody sports betting, and especially on the esports side of things. Um, but the thing is, we don't have the fuel. We don't have the actual, the people who actually want to do these things. And we think content is a way to actually drive traffic, and then we'll graduate them to the things that we want them to do, which is sports betting, which is, roulette, which is staying in our hotels, which is eating our food and beverage. Just really starting to tell the stories that are relevant to them and, and getting in that space more in an endemic way is what's important to us. And, it's the fuel, exactly right. You know, I would say when I work with my clients, and it's everything from from leagues to to games to the teams to even some athletes or, or endemics and non-endemics, right? It's really about kind of as Dan said, it's about finding your voice, it's about creating your brand, it's about speaking directly to the the viewers and and kind of getting them to feel exactly what it is that you want to be known for, so that when you are attracting your sponsors, you're creating more content, it's kind of built around then a, an idea of, of what separates your team or your league or, or your game from you know, the, the umpteenth millions of that, are, you know, that are now out there and that are coming into it. It's actually a really good point. Uh, we've seen you know, over the past, say, five years, um, an, an explosion of custom content from Twitch to YouTube to social media platforms. So what are you doing to kind of separate your content from all of that other content that's kind of flooded the internet? OK. So I, I, what I do is I really try to be like the loudmouth redhead in the room that pushes people into uncomfortable territory when it comes to this space, because uh, I think we all could do a better job in this and it's about telling, I think one, we need to be like hyper specific when a brand or anyone is trying to target this space, like know your audience, know what you want out of this, find your end goals and then just own it. Um, take crazy risks that make sense. Um, things that, you know, if you're SAP and you're in Dota 2, for example, and you know that that's a space, pull away a little bit from the signage and do something that's really on brand. There's many examples that have, uh, of companies that are killing it in that space, so I mean, you could look it up, DHL, Mercedes, that are starting to understand that taking really calculated, like creative risks makes sense. But I think what I like to do is tell people that you don't have to focus on one particular channel. Um, have a story that interweaves, you know, in Twitch chat to an Instagram story that connects to your page. Like send people on a wild goose chase, you know, that pulls and tells this overarching story of how your brand is impacting the space. I think that's gonna wind up being like, where I want to push people to into 2020. And I, and I think it's a great point is the targeting is um, there is really no one size fits all content strategy for gamers. This, you know, gaming is a title you can slap on this whole thing, but it's not just one community. It's, you know, we were talking earlier, it's really kind of overlapping communities of all of these different very enthusiastic, passionate gamers that love a particular game on a particular platform or a particular gamer in that uh, community. Uh, so. You have to pick your spots, and I think that's part of what the targeting comes in. And, and don't try to one size fits all this. And, and don't be afraid to take risks either. I think if you, as a gamer, or if you have that gamer on staff that 
if it resonates with them, there's a really good chance that it's going to resonate uh, with a larger group of gamers. So sometimes you can get over analytical of, uh, you know, and then you're, you're, you're tripping over your own feet to, to just go out there and do things and then get that response back from the community. That should then guide your hand to what your next steps are. And then from there, you can then build out a much broader, more multifaceted content strategy. Like Absolutely, and also like you're going to offend somebody. Uh, we can all play the same game and then I actively disagree on that game or what makes it great or makes it bad. Um, and so you know you want to you do as much marketing research you possibly can to eliminate the backlash, but know that this is a really distinctive audience that I can love first person shooters but hate battle royales, right? Like <laughs> just even focusing on like, oh, as a company, I want to get into first person shooter space or MOBAs. Know that they're all very distinct and uh, Dota fans and League of Legends fans are not the same and <laughs> they will disagree on why their game is better. And just knowing that like you hyper-focusing and taking risks is how you're going to find out where you're going to fit best into the space. Yeah, I think the market research that you just mentioned is, is hypercritical. Um, mostly because one of my biggest fears is coming off as a fraud or having fraudulent activity around this space because you get called out and it doesn't do you any justice in this space. So what we try to focus on is what we are good at and the stories that we are good at telling and where we find synergy between us and gaming is the sweet spot. Um, if we can't find that sweet spot, then we shouldn't be playing in the space, period. And uh, it, you kind of hit what I was going to say. I think what's cool about this space right, is, is that there's a lot of content out there. There's a lot of different platforms. Um, the audience is thirsty, but they also have the biggest BS meter probably of you know most any audiences. So, and, and I'm going to use the buzzword we all hate, right? So you got to be authentic. You got to be real. You, you got to you got to know your audience and really know who you are because they can smell it. And you know you kind of get that one chance to, to screw up. Um, and if you kind of put content out that is that is fraudulent, that is not really geared towards your audience or who you really are, um, you're kind of kind of dead in the water because they're going to move on because there's th there's other platforms and like I said, they're, they're thirsty for what they want and for what's authentic and real, and they'll they'll sniff it out and, and you're gone. I would take that one step farther and knowing that we hear authenticity in this space, like to the point where we're like, I get it, like you have to be <laughs> authentic in the gamers, like I. It's frustrating and I, I think altruism is really the next step, which is like if you want to be here, prove it. Show how you're actually impacting these people, creating memories. Like as a, I think in the world of live events lately because that's my uh, most recent background. Um, and I just, all I see is the opportunities for brands to make an incredible impact here. So if I were gonna take like Rocket League Championship as an example, uh, I walked around the concourse being like, why are we not doing anything with this internal space? If I was a brand, I would have been setting up things for me and my son to do, rather than everybody leave, because it's eight hours. You're there for eight hours to watch, and most fans want to watch their team, not every single match at the event. So taking that and figuring out how you're going to see your ROI, like, well, for starters, it could have just been a soccer net in the concourse where I was incentivized to kick a ball with my kid and I was doing something active that had enrollment factor. Um, if people are at PAX West and they're standing in a lineup, like, that's an opportunity for even non, not big brands, but startups to make an impact. Like figure out what you're gonna do to entertain people at South by Southwest when they're lining up or, you know, to look for those opportunities to really engage with people that bring something to the memories and experience of what they're excited and jazzed about to be part of. And I think that's a, a unique uh, example or really an opportunity because if you look at how esports and traditional sports are both kind of learning, from each other, right? If you walk out of the court concourse at an NBA game, there's oh, there's Verizon and shoot the hoop for a you know free wireless month or whatever the the, the activation is, and it's just literally littered around the, the concourse. And I think that's something that esports is is learning from traditional sports in terms of putting off these bigger and bigger events, and these bigger and bigger venues um, is how to engage because that too could be content, right? I mean, it all kind of comes back to you know what are you representing now in a physical form when people are actually passing by your brand or your booth. And then how do you actually you know, capture the imagination, get them to do something, and then that in turn is a learning one, but then it could be something that grows into a bigger strategy. You 100%, know? and like that, if, let's say you're gonna activate in that space, that story should have began weeks before the tournament even happened to tell them that they're not gonna have to leave this space, they can make their plans to exist here. Um, work in that brand story, work with the partners of Rocket League to figure out how you know you can in tandem tell this really cool story through Instagram that connects all of your accounts. And that's where this, the, you know, that assist on strategy, your day-to-day -day social media person cannot take that challenge on. Um, 
events is a great opportunity to make a really big splash, um, pull in all the extra strategy you can to weave that story. That, again, the impact is going to make a difference. And one of the things that I've seen, I've, I've been in this industry for over 25 years, both as a competitor and uh, on the industry side, and I've seen a lot of things done wrong. I've seen a lot of companies that, you know, go to one influencer or one person within the industry and just assume that they know everything and trust them explicitly and see it kind of blow up in their face and on Reddit and, you know, Reddit can be your friend or your foe. Um, so can you talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that you guys have seen uh, either your companies make or other companies make that you've kind of learned from? You want me to call someone out? You don't need to call uh, them out directly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just yeah. kind of like, like uh, what's been learned. Yeah, I'll call someone out. Um, okay, for me, a prime example of what not to do, uh, not to pick on THQ Nordic. I'm going to pick on THQ Nordic a little bit. Uh, they're an incredible company, but when it came to social, they didn't really have a so dedicated social media person. So it came down to, you know, we want to have a conversation. Someone as an intern put up the idea of having an AMA but they said, I guess they sold it like it was a Reddit, but it was on like 8chan. And I don't know if you guys know what 8chan is, don't Google it. Um, it's just, that's not the same community. So you need to be really strategic on where you think that your audience is going to be and makes sense to be in that space. It's not that their game fans weren't on 8chan, but that's not how you want to make an impact. And at the end of the day, what happened was they were all over social in a very negative way on every single press that you could possibly think of for game space. I read, I read so, about it on Reddit, it was very yeah, bad. Yeah. And I think that comes down to just the lack of organization that sometimes comes about how to actually tell a con like a full story. Um, it's more involved than just being like, okay, we need to be part of a Reddit channel right now in AMA. Like it's, this is something you have to build. Carefully tiptoe into this space and own it. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna say, I, I think it's sort of either jumping into the space without really understanding why you're there or who the audience is, um, or frankly, just talking down to them. And I'm gonna go with kind of a, a non-esports blow up that I've been dealing with. Um, and since they're not here, I'll talk about them for a second, right? But at uh, Ultra Music Festival this year, they had uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken sponsor 15 minutes on the main stage. And they had literally the, the Colonel come out, you know, dressed in this Colonel outfit and play EDM, and I'm using that term really loosely because it wasn't even more than just hit the button, and it completely backfired, right? The, the audience was there for true EDM experience. This was horrible. It was placating to them. It was clearly marketing. It wasn't knowing the audience, and, and both Ultra and KFC got enormous backlash. Granted, a big paycheck, but, you know, that was it. It's the same thing in, in eSports and, and video games, right? It's everyone sort of thinks, oh, if I just put a booth up, if I just, you know, throw my game out there, and I build it into a, a well-known game or, or build it with a team, then clearly I'm gonna get, uh, you know, I, I'll get the runoff. Um, and while the audience really is sort of thirsty for what is the next thing, what else can I learn, what makes sense, you have to understand who they are and how your brand is gonna actually make sense for them. So one of the things that I always deal with when I have clients who, you know, come and say, I wanna break into the esports space, right? One, that drives me crazy because it, it's not, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. And the first question is, you know, who are you? Why do you wanna be here? And what are you really trying to reach? And how authentic are you gonna be with it? And then it's helping them find the right platform, the right game, the right channel. Maybe it's a league, maybe it's a team, maybe it's a, a competition, maybe it's a conference to help it so that the audience you're trying to reach will connect with them, does make sense for, for why they're there, and is not talking down an audience or placating or, or frankly just an obvious marketing ploy. I think that's a great example, right? And I think, um, <clears throat> you know, to the marketers out there, I think you should know who your brand is, you should know what that persona of your brand is, and I think the more important discussion here is who is the audience, right? Because you might have an existing audience, but if you're trying to break into gaming or esports, you really need to take your time, which is, on one side, I encourage you to, to go out and test things and try things, but before you do any of that, you have to understand. You have to survey the landscape and, and see what may or may not resonate because, you know, we make a lot of mistakes, but I think that we're making them, you know, at least a calculated risk that turns into a mistake because some pieces of content that we spend weeks planning, you know, it, it kind of falls flat when it actually gets out there on YouTube. And then something else where it was kind of an ad hoc, having a couple of pro esports players play Jenga during one of our streams, the thing took off and now it's an annual thing. So now we're known as the, you know, the, the brand that helped, you know, facilitate this Jenga competition, which was just, we had it sitting in the corner and we did it. So, you know, again, if it resonates with you and the gamers on staff and just, you know, who you know you're trying to be as a brand or a product or service, 
then you could take those risks, but it all really does start with understanding who that audience is because you can certainly swing and miss in a spectacular fashion. And those things are harder to come back from. You can, get, you can come back from you know, not getting as many views or clicks on an ad or, or, or an engagement, but it's the bigger things you don't want to step in that uh, can hurt for years to come. I actually watched that first Jenga match, and I think a lot of it had to do with not necessarily the fact that they were playing Jenga, but who you had playing Jenga. Like, like a lot of the personalities really uh, kind of promoted that and blew that up, and it was really fun to watch. And, and I think that comes back to the point of who is the influencer? You know, because you, you, you sign an influencer or a team, uh, they're, they're essentially your brand boys, right? They're a face of your brand now. And we do a tremendous amount of vetting, and there's, you know, there's you know, stats and all of that, of this many streams or concurrence and all that, okay. But really, you have to, to talk to the individual. You have to see who they represent themselves as. And, and there's going to be mistakes made there too, right? I mean, these are individuals that are living their own life, and they're going to say things and do things that, you know, are completely off script. But if at the core, you know, you know who they are and that they're just good people and they love gaming, and you're a facilitator of them in these situations, good, that's where the good stuff happens. So don't be afraid, but certainly landscape, you know, survey the landscape to make sure you know what, what path you're taking. And, and to jump in on that one, when, when, if you're going to work with an influencer, which obviously is, is a phenomenal marketing tool, um, make sure, one, that the influencer actually likes you and, and, and likes your product and, frankly, resonates with it and understands it and is not in it just for the money or for the fame, but is, is in it because he believes or she believes in your product because it'll come across. Um, and there's nothing worse because the influencer, again, wants to protect their brand and, and their realism to, and their honesty to their, uh, to their viewership. Um, so they're happy to take your money and then talk crap about you online if, if they really feel that way. And, of course, that's not what you're paying for. So, you know, there are a lot of clients that I have that are like, oh, we need to definitely work with this person. I'm like, why? Like, they don't like your thing. They don't make sense. They don't want it. Just because they have, you know, two million viewers doesn't mean that they're the right spokesperson. So partnering with an influencer that truly actually feels you, believes you as part of your team and bring them into the team, the decision making, and let them kind of own some of the space and the decisions um, goes a long way when it comes to what you're actually trying to get out there. Hey, I'll add on to that. It just has a consumer of content actually watching these ads when they're midstream or during a broadcast of an esports event. If we live in this hashtag ad just world in this environment now where we can scope it out, and not only can we scope it out, but the streamers themselves are being transparent about it. So exactly that. If they don't love it, and then they're broadcasting the fact that this is a commercial, it's even worse. It's only doing damage to the brand itself. So it's you have to be careful, because the people vote with their clicks and their viewership and their eyeballs, and they'll click away. They tend to do that if they feel like their favorite streamer isn't being authentic to themselves. They just go away, and somebody who gets 20,000 average is now getting 10. So it really damages both sides. It damages the brand of the streamer and it damages the brand of whoever's trying to get their, their message out there. I would also say like next steps. Like I think we also rely a little too much on influencer marketing without having like a built out strategy that surrounds and supports them, right? It's like, oh, I'm gonna get the numbers because I signed you know, Dr. Lupo to do the following thing and it's gonna be great and that's enough. <laughs> One, yes, listen to the influencer to help try to figure out how they could best sell your brand. You know, like a doctor disrespect has a certain thing. I, I keep thinking of the Gillette. Sponsorship is still my favorite thing to this date. If you don't know it, definitely Google this one. Um, it, just how he announced the mere sponsorship for Gillette was the coolest thing. And you knew that it made Gillette uncomfortable. Like, I, don't, I wasn't in that room. I wish I was in that room. I feel like it probably went like, you're going to just start singing the Gillette song on air, and it was amazing. I had probably watched that video a billion times, but that was that was the trust that the influencer, you know, like someone trusted to find the right fit for that voice. And then at the same time, I feel like the next step for that as a brand is, you know they're gonna do that, tie it into every single part of your digital and social campaign to help, you know, flush it out. Because what I didn't see was Gillette really owning that on their channels. That he was doing it on his, but that was an opportunity to then continue that entire story, like across your entire marketing. And, and I, know. I was going to ask you, it's, it's funny, and, and you know, one of the things I have to deal with, especially when you're talking about a, a true non-endemic brand that is, what we'll call them a state brand that really should not be in esports, but, but wants to, and maybe they're used to more traditional marketing, is trying to let them know that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, and, and in fact, you should be, and just sort of trust that this is going to happen correctly. Um, because one of my issues is dealing with the in-house councils at these big brands that are used to licensing and sponsorship agreements that are not at an esports level, that are not 
and this content that are not fast moving, that is not a team dedicated to be there 24 seven because when something goes wrong, you gotta fix it right away. And it, it's, I've seen more license agreements just die on the vine because they wanna cross every you know, T and dot every I and they wanna argue with you about should this be an A or a D. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is educate other lawyers, right? Because we all are kind of stayed in our ways um, of, of how to think a little bit different and kind of just trust that this is a thing and it's going to be okay to be uncomfortable and, and to give up a little bit of control. Your palms should be sweaty. Yeah. That's <laughs> And uh, one thing that, that I have noticed is the marketing in general has kind of shifted with uh, the advent of the influencers coming in and just kind of really changing how uh, products in and out of esports market their brands. So how would you say like, you know, the importance of knowing not only your audience and your brand, but also the influencers that, that you're choosing and how that they, think they can relate to your audience and your brand and their audience and their brand? I mean, our strategy is really unique because we're trying to embrace a new audience. So the strategy when it comes to gaming and esports is bring in somebody that doesn't exist in our portfolio today. So we really look at each of these streamers, each of these entities, teams especially. So you think of a team like the Immortals, it's very different than a team like FaZe. One isn't better than the other in the context of our strategy, but they definitely bring different audiences. So when we formulate a strategy around content, for instance, we may want to do something with FaZe that's built around more fun, more nightclubs, more restaurants, more blah, blah, blah. With Immortals, we may be more like a boot camp. So it's definitely more strategic about what we're looking to do based off of who that entity is and what audience they bring in because that's gonna completely tailor our content and the way that we react to it. And you can go so many different directions, right? You can sponsor a tournament, you can sponsor a team, you can sponsor an influencer, you can sponsor a celebrity, right? That may have a passion for gaming. And I think all of those have to be fairly calculated decisions. But um, I think, again, it's starting to mirror more and more traditional sports where you can be the official sponsor of the league and then the team. But what's different here is that um, these influencers are, you know, demanding a lot of attention. And, you know, they have that personality to go with their gaming cachet. Uh, that you're not necessarily going to get with every uh, player on, say, like a Cloud9 roster, right? So we sponsor Cloud9, which, if you're a marketer, we're still in this golden age of esports where if you sponsor Cloud9, you get the likeness of the whole team. That's not going to last for much longer. So, you know, a bit of advice there because I don't sponsor the Lakers and get LeBron, right? That's just not how it works. The esports world is catching up to traditional sports in a lot of ways, as, you know, on the other side of the coin, traditional sports is is also learning from uh, esports. But my, I guess my one point on this one in terms of which influencers to align with is um, we're, again, in another golden age of marketing is that we're so many tools, that there's social listening tools and social sentiment tools. And again, I always caution kind of paralysis by analysis, right? But there are ways that you can understand what the audience's reaction is to an individual, to their posts, and so on. And some of these tools are, you know, huge multi hundred thousand dollar in installations, but there's some, a lot more affordable tools that at least give you kind of a bead on what the reaction is to an influencer around a particular type of audience or a particular type of game. So again, as you're taking that broader view as a brand as to what is my plan, what's my entrance point, and what's that ongoing strategy, uh, make sure you have the tools as well. Because a lot of this is gut instinct that if it's good enough for you know the gamers, then it should resonate. But again, round that out with some data that uh, is, is readily available with these social listening tools. Yeah, also I think like while you're trying to dive into the space, like let's take the assumption that you haven't yet had any kind of partnership relationship and you didn't get Cloud9 like HyperX <laughs> or anything the following. I would go like micro-influencers, while I hate that terminology, um, as far as streamers go, there are a lot of really great opportunities to test the waters uh, at a spend that makes sense to figure out where you really belong. And I think about all my, some of my favorites, uh, Andy Mission is a really incredible one. Um, I, she has such a consistent, amazing fan base that follow her because she's a rock star in that game. And they are loyal and log on when she is. Those are the kind of places I would probably start to test the waters and figure out what is actually resonating with them, what kind of, and, it, and work with them to figure out how to make that space. And then separate from influencers, um, one of the opportunities when you're really unsure as a company how you want to participate in this, I think a, a really great example is Gamers Outreach. Um, the charity angle of how you could actually make an impact in this space uh, and mean it, and it's, it's something that gives back. Their LAN events are incredible. Um, partnering with someone like that is a great way to like tiptoe into this space. And I'd say if you're gonna break into the space, right, one, be realistic about who you are, um, and two, have some thick skin because you're gonna get 
feedback instantly, both good and bad. And if you sort of look at it as a way to further tailor your brand or your product, then you're even getting sort of analytics in a way to kind of move your product forward with this instead of just a pure marketing standpoint. Um, you know, I have clients that will do this in the first 10, you know, comments like this is the crappiest thing ever and what the hell and, you know, they're in the corner crying uh, and, and missing, you know, the, the thing that is coming out of it, which is, well, why is this crappy? Why is this not resonating and giving it an opportunity to sort of fix it in real time and, and to own that space rather than just say, everyone hates me and, you know, I'm going to go away because as we've all seen, you're going to get pros and cons the minute you get out there from no matter what it is you're doing and, and own it and, and, and learn from it. I was going to say the Tetris example is amazing also just from like the ability to pivot, right? Like you, you didn't think it was going to go anywhere and you were like, oh man, we're on to something here. And you create a whole new strategy based off that. And I think that's the best part of just kind of figuring out where you belong and then curving and just jumping on. You're going to find your way in. And the other thing is right now there's, an, there's a never-ending well of up-and-coming influencers, right? I mean, uh, there's the, what I'd say, the, the, you know, the, the, the top tiers of the ninjas and the Dr. Lupos and so on. These are, they're celebrities now. They're, they're streaming and they're trying to stream as regularly as possible, but they're off now doing photo shoots and they're going to be in movies. And I mean, it's, it's fascinating what's happening right now. But the point there is that there's, there's people that are grinding and they are working hard. If you look at who just qualified for the Fortnite World Cup, Look at through that list, you don't recognize a lot of those names, right? Because they're coming out of nowhere and they could be the next Dr. Lupo or the next, you, you don't know. But again, that for me, it goes back to the tools. There's tools that allow you to kind of understand who is the up and comer, right? Because we've done a lot of that. We've invested in, in, in Pokimane, who's going to be on a panel, right? We got her, you know, when she, you know, she was an up and comer and now, you know, she's getting more and more notoriety. And that's the thing is that, you know, there's a never ending well there. So again, if you're a brand looking to get into this space, uh, now, now is the time, and there's a lot of tools that can help you along that journey. And talking about just getting into the general space, like we've, we've seen companies come in and just say, oh, I'll just be title sponsor here, or I'll just sponsor th this event, and that's really easy to do. But can you talk more about how to kind of grow your, your, your ecosystem and kind of grow that audience and not just be a title sponsor that has a name on a stream? Uh, yeah, we're starting to do that now. I mean, in the presentation, I talked about our ability to amplify events. We're just digging in. We're starting to learn. We're getting our hands dirty. We're making mistakes, like you said. We're not afraid to do that anymore and, and coming off just being a little bit wrong. It's okay. As long as we learn and we take that learning and grow and continue to do those things where we build an audience, then good. So what we've been able to do is partner with our friends at Esports Arena, do more with them, start to actually bring that, because a lot of stuff comes to us. We have about a, a partnership with every team or sports league that you can imagine. They're all coming to us with esports initiatives, and we need to press them and put them somewhere. We have a studio in one of our properties that's built for success with HyperX. We need to start doing more of those things and leveraging our resources in ways that we haven't in the past. That's how we win, and just doing that more often, using what we have to our, our capabilities, like Level Up inside of MGM, which is conducive for esports events, which we've done with Grand Pooh Bear, another micro-influencer. Elevate him, give him more of a, of a stage and a platform to be successful. So we really look at ourselves as the offline platform for a very heavy online entity. And, and we, that's what we want to be, it's a plug-in for that. And I, and I think you need to engage. I think, you know, you know there's a, a whole different level of status of people in the room and, and others in terms of where your brand is at. You could be a very household name, like a T-Mobile. Everybody knows who T-Mobile is, but the gamers don't necessarily know or care, right? So it's, if you're a household name and you're trying to get a, an authentic name within gaming, that's one way. Or you could be a, a brand that's just trying to get on the map, right? Um, so with all of this, I think to the, to the question is, uh, do good, right? And do something that you would as a gamer appreciate if a brand did to you, right? Rather than like to your point of just slapping your name on something, mean, mean something, right? Uh, have a promotion where you can give something away or you engage them in a way that's, uh, that's positive and a little bit different. And that's, that's what I think it's all about is that this community, uh, like you said, their BS meter is off the charts, but they also are truly appreciative of those content creators and those brands that understand what they like and what makes them tick. And, and you find those ways to give back, either through just a very relevant piece of content or something that you're maybe doing at an activation at an event or something of that nature. I, I think he's 100% correct that, you know, the, their, their BS meter is, is off the chart, but so is their appreciation. And if you're a brand looking to break in and you can show there's a reason why you chose this particular game or event or team and that you're actually adding some value to it and you understand it more than you're just a brand that paid some money and, and threw your name out and you're kind of, you know, helping create the system and, and, and give something back that is, uh, that is engaging to them, um, 
they'll be more appreciative and they'll actually then go, okay, good, this is a brand that actually understands me or took the time to try to understand me rather than even if you're the better brand that just threw some money at it and kind of placated the system, so to speak. Um, you know, they, the authenticity, again, cheesy word, uh, but, you know, but, but it, it's real in this, in this sense. They want to know that you, you took the time to understand them, what they're looking for, uh, and if you can even sort of help fill a need or, or fix an issue, that's even better. I'm going to take one step back from that and even say, like, before you even want to enter the space, your hiring is so key on the kind of people that you're connecting. And that's where, like, if you were really just entering this space and you're going, okay, I know that I want in and I need a social media manager, um, don't confuse social media manager with community builder. Um, <laughs> like, if you know what game you're going to focus on, don't hire a Counter-Strike expert for a Dota 2 game unless they just so happen to be also a Dota 2 fan. And um, those kind of like taking a step back and really figuring out where you belong before you make those key uh, hires. And then at the same time, know that they're going to be, it's a skeleton team. You, what you're asking them to do to build a content strategy, et cetera, there's going to be those times that you're going to want that outside support for strategy. And it's going to be based around the events. Your big, you know, if you want to be at uh, E3, it's going to take more than your one person, two person marketing team to nail that out if you want to cut through the noise. And so pick your battles wisely. <laughs> well, your, your social media manager should be your aspirational client or, or at least have some understanding of your client, right? If, if your social media manager is my age, you, you're screwed, you know, on, on, on <laughs> right away. Um, you know, your social media manager needs to be your target audience because they know what resonates. They know what works for them. They speak that language. They, they're going to be able to sort of shift and weave and, and get it, um, you know, uh, again, sort of pick, pick, pick your team. And also know your platforms, like to follow up, like the fact that like Twitter is, a, is an engagement. That's, you don't need content there. You need someone who is quick and can just have like regular chats with your fans, your followers, your potential brand mother. Like that's- And also knows not to cross the line because we've also, seen that Also, yeah, like don't, don't overdo it. Uh, but no, like the, it, and that's when you're gonna hire, you're gonna wanna make sure what they're most comfortable with. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, not everybody can do everything <laughs> unanimously. Like what's, what's more important to your, your audience? Is it Twitter? Is it Instagram? You know, is it B2B and you're spending more time on LinkedIn? I would still tell you Instagram's probably where you should be, but. Separate from that, like that's also just a really important hiring the right person. And, and the whole team, right? Because uh, esports doesn't sleep, right? One tournament's ending in North America and it's starting up in Europe. And then it's in, it's, it, it, if, if you put too much on one individual as a social media manager, even the community manager, it's, it's gonna burn them out quickly. So that person who's the voice, they need the surrounding resource. And I'm not saying that you have to hire a ton of staff to help that person, it's just, as a marketing organization or as an entire organization, there has to be a level of buy-in that we're gonna do this and we're gonna support this initiative and we're gonna support this individual because if somebody feels like they're out on an island and holding all this down, they're gonna be jumping ship really, really quickly. So that support from kind of top down, you can still do the experimental test and try and learn and grow, but there has to be a philosophical kind of buy-in that we're gonna do this thing and we're gonna be supportive and we're gonna give you the resources that you need because again, it is a 24 hour cycle it is just non-stop there is no off season in esports right and so you have to be in it and you have to be like it's like twitter right something's going to happen at midnight and you're not going to see it till 6 a.m the next morning and by that time who knows what could have happened so the reliance on other team members is is absolutely key yeah speaking about being timely uh, not to pick on kfc again but i will bring up something yeah. that they do very well <laughs> um their their twitter platform and what they do around <laughs> gaming is actually pretty strong um, it's just something that I use as an educational tool internally. Their tagline is finger clicking good, and it's, it's good. They make posts constantly throughout the day, and it's all relevant. They know what games that they're good at. They're good at Call of Duty. They've even done activations with Call of Duty with a prize, and it's been distributed on Twitch. Like, they've done a good job using Twitter as a platform to get their message out and in a relevant way. So I, I'll give them props on that. Although I did see your video you're talking about, it was awful. I, oh, it was terrible. Uh, uh, and, and I'll give you my quick two-second legal tip, too, right? If, if you're engaging a social media manager um, in, in your contract, have a non-defamatory clause because there's nothing worse than somehow pissing off your social media manager and they quit. And then everyone knows that that was social media manager and they quit. And now they're out there going, let me tell you why I quit this company. They absolutely sucked and here's what they did. And it completely backfires. Um, so I would just kind of also think about what happens, you know, on the You backside. mean don't do what HMV did when oh. they, hi uh, they fired everybody and the social media manager was live tweeting it? Yeah, that's a really bad call. 
So uh, I just want to quickly point out we've got about five minutes left. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can uh, go to slido.com or uh, use the app and submit any of your questions. Uh, but I do have one, one last question for our panel uh, as those questions come in, because I see all of you guys actively typing them in right now. Um, where do you kind of see this space in five years and 10 years? Where do you kind of see this space? You're not even paying attention. Look at that. <laughs> where do you for me, it's around live events because that's the part that's really missing in the North American esports story, right? Like, I mean, South Korea is like seven years ahead of us on all fronts for that. So to me, it's just like we, like the Rocket League example, or even if I was going to say, I worked on the Twitch uh, Broadcaster Royale PUBG series that we started in. Um, PAX West, and then it carried on to TwitchCon. And I think about that as the next iteration. It, like, it wasn't just enough of having this arena event. They had like cars sourced, like the in, like, I don't know, a ton of cars from Russia that we got that people could recognize from the game. But I see that as how brands start to get involved. That you're bringing something to the table, and those stories, all those brands are working together to incentivize why people are going to go and attend this space. So taking the Philly Fusion example, you have a phenomenal challenge of filling those seats in Philadelphia, not just for like one final game, or because it's not gonna be there, it's going to be uh, the home games that's gonna be a challenge. So if I was a brand buying into that, I'm gonna wanna know that you are deeply gonna bring something to the audience to pull them out of their home space to come to this game. So treating, I think of going to, I'm a Raptors person, I've been in Toronto forever, like those environments like Jurassic Park or those, brand moments that we're all participating together. That's what I think is the future. And then from a content perspective, it's the story that starts before that even happens and it perfectly weaves everything, everyone who's involved in the fans. Uh, I, I echo Kirsty on this. I think that we'll see, start to see a transition from online to offline. Um, I think that we're in a prime position to actually take advantage of those things. But I, I also liken mostly the streamer side of things, mostly to the music industry, more so than the sports industry. I, I look at these, these uh, artists as, like a musical artist, there's a different genre for every game title, and they have constant content that's coming out. So I really see them really taking their platforms and pushing it more offline and getting closer to their fans and having a, an extended amount of engagement. Um, I, in the next five years, we'll probably look back at Twitch and think to ourselves, can you believe they, they were doing this in their bedroom? I, I actually think that they're gonna upgrade what we see on these platforms to a level that we can't even imagine now. Um, it'll no longer be like a messy background and a dog in the background. Like, it'll be in a real live studio and it's gonna be to a platinum level, no, no longer just homegrown or grassroots. Yeah, I agree on the events. The events are only a bigger, uh, more, you know, likened to huge concert festivals and, and so on. And I do think, you know, for us HyperX, we ran this campaign where we took musicians and athletes and streamers and gamers and kind of put them together. This colliding of worlds right now uh, is, is something that, too, who knows what the next five, ten years bring, but it's certainly exciting, right? You see the Metarama coming up, which is top name, tier one talent, uh, Snoop Dogg, but then you also have all of these streamers and gamers. So. That to me is going to be an interesting thing to, to, to watch as it evolves to where how do you take these very different lifestyles to some degree and, and create a, you know, a, an opportunity and an atmosphere where that they can each thrive in their own way but still learn from the others and engage with the others. So that's it's going to be a very interesting evolution over the next five years. Awesome. And I don't want to cut off anybody, but we do have some questions. Uh, so what is the best real world content creator plus brand engagement example and what platforms were used? Anybody. <laughs> What does the panel think real world content creator is? Like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't not think of Dr. Disrespect because that guy is just endless to me. Um, I hope that he get, winds up having movies, his own TV show. It's just, I want to see it, one, but two, I don't think anyone does it more naturally and you were lucky if you get him. And if you're not trying to buy Dr. Disrespect, you've done yourself a disservice. Although also keep in mind, he is a little bit uh, too fluid but I, okay, but like that's no, also no part. I would ar I would I would argue <laughs> that that's part of you know phase. For example, like you can say a lot of things, but they take risks, and that doesn't hurt their audience, right? Uh, the brands that are riding that train didn't get actually damaged by anything that's happened to phase. Uh, Doctor disrespect, if anything, got more attention from it. So like, what are you really concerned about here? Because when I thought about Doctor disrespect doing that, I wasn't like, well, Gillette's a jerk. Like, that doesn't, that's not how it works. So you have to really start, like, tone down on your brand protection when you get involved in the space, and I don't think anything is actually negatively attached, right, to supporting a streamer like Dr. Disrespect. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, there's no one who better 
uh, engages with his audience, uh, finds a way to work in uniquely each brand sponsorship that he has. Uh, again, separate from Gillette, look up G Fuel and the commercials and the whole thing. It's the best. All right, and uh, we have only a couple minutes left because we, we did start a couple minutes late. So uh, what is the role of the high-end professional filmmaking storytelling in esports? I'll, I'll jump in just really quickly. I think there is a spot for it. Um, I think that uh, while most of the content that we provide is, is it might seem a little ad hoc, you know, what's 20 question? What makes you rage quit, right? Well, you know, Jenga, right? And I think that there's an appreciation for that kind of off the cuff. Uh, just trying to get that peek behind the, the, into the personal life, if you will, of a professional gamer or streamer, but the professional way that you can storytell via documentary style or getting behind the scene that, you know, that, that level of production, there's an appreciation for it, right? We've all watched a great documentary or great behind the scenes, and it's like, okay, that was really well put together, and there are so many great stories out there in gaming and esports that are waiting to be told that I do think there will be a, a, a strong place for that level of, um, you know, I guess, filmmaking or content creation? I think it's going to be the most important thing to sort of reaching the, uh, the, non, the, the more mainstream audience, right? If you just look at Netflix's series Formula One that they did, it was a 10-part a series on Formula One race cars. Um, if you've never seen Formula One because, you know, you, you've just never seen it or that's not something, but you came across it, it was a phenomenal, very engaging documentary that the minute that it ended, all I wanted to do was watch the next season of Formula One and next, you know, I overnight became a fan and not of the top tier team because it wasn't focused on Ferrari or Mercedes, it was focused on the, uh, the 3 through 12, and all of a sudden I actually cared about a Formula One uh, you know, series and a thing that I'd never cared about two days before. Um, I think when we start getting more of these documentaries and high-end things about esports and video games in the world that we all kind of know, the mainstream audience that doesn't really know what, what it is will start becoming engaged and interested just because you reach them through what they're used to and pull them into our world. And uh, we, we, we do need to wrap up, but I do think this, this one last question is really important. Uh, can, can you speak a little bit more to the marketing research tools available for finding these underrated talents uh, and the well uh, upcoming influencers? Because I, I, I do think it is very difficult to know where to look for these people. I'll, I'll name a, a couple tools that we use. Just uh, There's one that's called Sidekick. Uh, it's spelled weird because it's an internet company. I think there's a Q and a K in there. Um, uh, but it's a it's a it's a tool that allows you to see you know stats and engagement on influencers, and then we use a platform called Sprinkler. Again, and can't just be spelled Sprinkler; you have to take the e out. Um, but it's just a social listening and management tool. So all of our posts and everything kind of goes through one tool, which is also great from internally. Um, everybody has visibility, so it's not just one person at the controls; it's the whole organization that has the controls of that platform. So there's a, a good amount of checks and balances on your social media strategy, but there's a lot of other tools just like Sidekick and Sprinkler out there, uh, various price levels and all of that, but the tools are there. I mean, it, it's easy and to And I'd get say before data. you even get the tool uh, and you're figuring out how your brand fits in the space, uh, do a calling all nerds in your company and see if anyone who's already working there who understands this space might have some insight and give you some guidance even before you sign up, just so you have somewhere to look, you know? Also find out what they're nerdy in. You know, their yeah, their exactly. nerd to may not be gaming. Yeah. All right, uh, I want to thank all of our panelists here. I want to thank all of you for being here. And uh, that's going to do it for us. Can I get this one? Come on, six.